I'd like to say a few things about the UK's position in the WTO, which has become a lot clearer since the referendum in June of last year. But there's still some confusion I see from time to time in the papers. So I think it's important uh, to lay out the situation as I see it, and also, coincidentally, as the government sees it, and as third countries and the WTO are now increasingly seeing it. What was said uh, around the time of the referendum was that the UK's position in the WTO was fragile, that it is only in the WTO because it's an EU member state. And as soon as the UK leaves the EU, it's somehow free floating um, and doesn't really know what its rights and obligations are in the WTO. So to that, um, it can easily be said that uh, there are certain things where the UK's position will change not a bit. And the first of those is that the UK has rights as a WTO member, in fact, as an original WTO member, which it became in 1995. And those rights are the rights to sue other countries, uh, to protect its legal interests, um, and to vote, and well, a whole panoply of rights that every WTO member has. Now, what about its obligations? It's a little bit odd that the conversation seems to have focused on uh, whether or not the UK has obligations. And in fact, those who said the UK's position was fragile uh, often ended up saying, well, the UK has no obligations, which is a bit peculiar. So let me just say how these work. There are two sorts of obligations in the WTO. The first are cross-cutting. Don't discriminate, for instance. Basic rule. Don't have blocks on goods at the border coming in and out. A basic rule. Unless, of course, you can justify this on public policy grounds. Now, no one, I think, has said that these rules uh, will apply any different, differently to the UK. Where all the argument hinges is on the special commitments that each WTO member makes uh, about border measures. And when it comes to goods, these are customs duties. Customs duties are the only way in which a WTO member is allowed to protect its domestic industry. You can't do it in any other way. So these are important and they are individual to each WTO member. And it's the same in services. It's not customs duties because services uh, can't be taxed at the border as goods can be, but they're similar restrictions on how many banks you can have in a country and so on. These are all called, called quantitative restrictions in the services case and customs duties in the goods case. Now, the EU submitted a schedule in 1995 for all of the then EU member states, and that, of course, included the UK. And this was possible under WTO law. It wasn't that the EU was only submitting for itself. In fact, it's quite clearly expressed in the WTO agreement that it was submitting on behalf of other WTO members, including the UK. So all that happened, really, when the UK leaves the EU, as far as WTO law is concerned, and the schedules, is that it becomes responsible for those schedules. Whereas previously, the EU had stepped in if there was a disagreement on the UK's schedules, which would also have been the EU's schedules. Now the UK will be doing this job on its own. The only outstanding question is that there are some very, very minor items of some importance to some countries, uh, which are in the form of quotas, which are shared with the rest of the EU. And one has to divide those up, just like one has to divide up a house when one gets divorced. It might not be the easiest thing to do, as anyone who's seen a divorce will know, that doesn't mean that it's legally impossible. So really, that's a minor issue, and uh, in general, the picture is relatively clear. Dear world, yours.